Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me at the conference. My name is Anita Sengupta. I'm going to talk to you about the future of Mars exploration today. Um, to give you a little bit of a background on me, uh, I spent most of my career actually working for NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, on the robotic exploration of Mars. I spent several years developing electric propulsion systems. Ironically, our next speaker is also going to be speaking about that for the exploration of deep space. Then I spent about five years developing um, the landing system for the Curiosity rover by a show of hands who've heard of the Curiosity rover. Okay, I'll be talking a lot about that today. And then I spent about five years developing a facility for the International Space Station called the Cold Atom Laboratory, which I won't talk about today. Um, and then I decided to actually leave NASA and go and work for the private sector. My first venture into the private sector was on the development of the Hyperloop by a show at hands. Have people heard about the Hyperloop? Um, I worked for a technology company, actually, for about a year and a half. And then I decided to start my own aerospace company, which is called Aerospace Experience Technologies, uh, for a Basically, the second half of my career, I'm going to be focused on developing, um, developing aircraft for the purpose of urban transportation. And the reason why I left NASA, actually, is pretty simple. Um, I wanted to use my training as an aerospace engineer and my training as a leader to develop technologies to help us here at home. And so by working on green transportation technologies, you can actually couple space-age technology to a real-world problem here at home. And if you take a look at the graphic behind me, you can obviously see three planets. The one in the middle is pretty familiar. That's Earth. The one on the right-hand side is Mars, which has a very thin atmosphere, uh, very cold temperature, and no air on the surface, no oxygen as we know it. And the planet on the left-hand side, of course, is Venus, which is one planet in from us, which has a very high surface temperature, about 475 degrees centigrade, and has a pressure of about 100 times Earth's atmospheric pressure. And the reason why these three images are important is because at the formation of our solar system, we actually believe that these three planets were very similar to each other. So something happened over the course of the last four and a half billion years or so where our planets, um, even though very closely spaced, have evolved very differently from each other. So what we can see just by looking at Earth, Venus, and Mars is that climate change is actually a planetary phenomenon. So we know that it's very important that we have to think about what we do as a society and how we could potentially affect the climate here at home. And so I would like to encourage everybody as they venture out on their own technology startups to think about how what they're doing can actually make the world a better place. But to focus back on what we're doing with Mars exploration, what is interesting to know is that Mars has had a fascinating geological history. And so if you take a look at the images behind me, on the upper left-hand corner, you can see Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons is actually six times the height of Mount Everest and is an extinct volcano which means that at some point in Mars's past, there was a lot of volcanic activity. But in the past several billion years or so, we haven't seen any evidence of volcanic activity, and that was actually the purpose of the InSight mission, to make measurements of whether or not there's still volcanic activity. Another really interesting aspect about Mars is Valles Marineris that you can see in the lower image, and that's kind of Mars's version of the Grand Canyon. So we also know at some point in Mars's past that there was water flowing on the surface that created some of these surface features. But something happened to Mars, and what we believed happened is that many, many millions of years ago, there was an impact with an asteroidal object which disrupted the magnetic field. When the magnetic field was disrupted, the atmosphere was essentially ripped away, and it's no longer hospitable on the surface of the planet. So one of the reasons why we study Mars is to understand whether or not there could have been life on the past, and could there still be life today, perhaps in the subsurface on Mars. So by a show of hands, how many people think that there are moons on the surface of uh, or orbiting Mars as we speak? So there actually are. One is called Phobos, the other is called Deimos. And one of the future applications for these moons is actually to set up communications stations for future human colonies on the surface, and also to potentially mine them for minerals and waters for future human colonies. So what we do with the robotic space program is we develop technologies that can first explore these bodies and explore the surface of Mars, and then feed that forward to a potential few more human colonies in the future. So I think I already gave it away, um, but we do know that there is water frozen in the subsurface of Mars. And we've actually made measurements with robotic spacecraft exploring the surface features. And the images that you can see in this slide are evidence of water flows on the surface of Mars that are happening actually very weakly. 
frequently. Um, now, they're not water as in lots of water flowing down the sides of cliff faces, but they're basically wet mud flows. So what that means is that for a future human colony, you could potentially tap into that source of water and use it to grow food, use it to grow plants, use it to sort of use it for washing and other human needs that you would have for a future human colony. And so the robotic space program actually facilitates making these measurements around the surface of the planet. So landing on Mars happens to be a very difficult challenge. It's been done a total of eight times in the course of human history. Most recently, it was done by the InSight landing, which occurred in November of this past year. And it's been going on since the 1970s with the Viking landers. And so each time we have a landed mission on the surface of Mars, we develop technologies to land the size of crafts that goes there. And then we feed forward to develop new technologies to land something larger. So in this image, you can see um, sort of the evolution of rover technologies that have driven on the surface of the planet. In the lower portion of the image, you see the Sojourner rover, which was launched in the 1990s, about the size of a small child's play truck. In the middle, on the left-hand side, you can see the Mars Exploration rovers, which is about the size of a washing machine or a lawnmower. And of course, the Curiosity rover on the right-hand side uh, was sent in 2012, which was the size of a small car. And so with each one of these missions, we're expanding the ability for the rover to make scientific measurements on the surface because the rover can carry more scientific instruments. And over the course of the past 20 years, the emphasis has been looking for water on the surface of the planet, water in the subsurface of the planet, and most recently with the Curiosity rover looking for evidence of past habitability. So the Curiosity rover carried an instrument on board called a uh, mass spectrometer, which actually allows it to look for the evidence of organic compounds, which is, of course, what we're made of, which is what or organic matter, as we understand it, is made of today. The Curiosity rover also carried an instrument on board which allowed it to make measurements of surface radiation. And one of the greatest challenges to be able to put people um, living on the surface of Mars in human colonies is to be able to understand what the radiation levels are and then then design shielding technologies to protect people who would live in those colonies. So for those of you in the audience who are interested in starting a space startup in a technology area, radiation shielding technologies is actually an area which needs to be researched further and would be amenable for future startups in that area. The Curiosity rover was the very first mission to start looking at evidence of past habitability on the surface of the planet and then future and present habitability on the surface of the planet. It was very important in the Mars program going forward. And so in this particular graphic, you can see a two-dimensional projection of what the surface of Mars looked like. So by a show of hands, how many of you have either read the book or seen the movie The Martian? Okay, so I'd say about, you know, 50% of you. And so what's interesting there, of course, is that the lead character, Mark Watney, made use of different rover parts that he found on the surface of the planet to make his expedition on the way from one place to the next so they could escape off the face of the planet. And what you can see in the graphic here is the very different locations that we've already interrogated on the surface of the planet towards the center at Meridiani and then with MSL at Gale Crater. And the reason why we look at different places on the surface of the planet is because there are different surface features, there's different scientific understanding that we can get there. And on the lower right of the image, you can see Gale Crater, which is where the Curiosity rover was sent, which we believed at the time when we planned the mission was the site of an ancient water body. And after the rover landed on the surface and started to make measurements on the surface, we did confirm that that surface feature that we landed in was a dried up lake bed. And there used to be water there about as tall as my knee. So it's a pretty fascinating place to go to understand the past history of Mars on the surface of the planet. And so when we do these missions for the robotic space program, we collect that data and it feeds forward for future human exploration of Mars in terms of where we would want to set up our first colonies and what resources would be available to them to be able to live on the surface of the planet. So one of the most difficult things that we have to do for sending people to the surface of Mars is to develop landing technologies to land people safely on the surface. And so the way you do it, actually, is more like an airplane. And so in the image that you see here, you can see a bird on one hand side, and you can see something called an entry vehicle on the other side. Although the entry vehicle doesn't look like an airplane, it actually is. It has a lift to drag ratio, which means that you are generating drag to slow yourself down, and you're generating lift so that you can actually position yourself along um, a particular trajectory to get you to the landing site that you want it to go. 
So the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity mission was the very first time we did a lifting body entry, which was more like an airplane that flew itself autonomously to the landing site that we wanted to go to. And so this technology feeding forward to future human missions will allow us to land in specific landing sites of where we would set up a future human colony. So this video, which I'll show you now, walks you through the process of landing on the surface of Mars. You start off at an entry speed of around 20,000 kilometers per hour. Um, you slow down with aerodynamic drag down to around 1,000 kilometers per hour. You then deploy a very large supersonic parachute, which would basically occupy the entire side of the room that we're sitting in right now. That slows you down to around 300 kilometers per hour. You then do the rest of the descent on retro rockets. And the reason for that is the Martian atmosphere is too thin to be able to slow yourself all the way down with a parachute. And so the remainder of the descent is done retropropulsively, and then the rover lands on the surface of the planet. So this is very similar to the way you would land humans on the surface of the planet. Of course, the size of the vehicle will be much larger, the weight of the vehicle will be much higher to be able to support sending people to the surface of the planet. But from the autonomous control of this vehicle, you actually learn a lot from doing this sort of robotic led admission as it feeds forward to a future human mission. So this was the technology that we developed for the Curiosity rover landing, um, and it was the first time that it was done. It was done successfully, and it will be used on subsequent missions to the surface of Mars. So one of the other things that we developed for the Curiosity mission was an advanced power system. Prior rovers had used solar panels, which provide you a certain amount of power. This mission used nuclear power, specifically a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, so it generates its own power 24 hours a day, which gives it more power to do science and more power to run its heaters to keep it warm. So this is another example of a technology that you would want for a larger surface mission and, of course, for a future human colony, as described in the movie The Martian as well. So how long does it take to get to Mars? About seven to nine months. Ironically, that's in between the gestation period for a sloth and a human baby. But seven to nine months isn't actually that long. So you can imagine people being willing to make that kind of journey to get to a future human colony for setting up permanent habitation or just scientific missions. So it is a very tractable problem. Our mission we launched in November of 2011, and we arrived in August of 2012. The landing system that I showed you in that graphic is the one that was used. It's an autonomous landing system. And so right after the rover landed itself on the surface of the planet, it was commanded to take a picture of its landing site that you can see here. In the middle, you see a mountain called Mount Sharp, which was the destination the rover had to drive to to collect its scientific information. But what is interesting about this graphic is how similar it actually looks to desert environments here on Earth. So it's important to realize that our planets, the terrestrial planets, which is Venus, Earth, and Mars, are very similar to each other in terms of surface composition, in terms of surface topography. So you can see how we could eventually want to go there if we're able to protect ourselves against the hazards that do exist there. So in this graphic, this is a very important scientific instrument that was on board the rover. Um, it's called the LIBS instrument. It actually basically had a laser, fired it into a rock, generates a vapor, and allows you to determine what the composition of that rock is or what that soil is. It allows you to repeatedly make measurements of what the surface environment is around you. And that information is very important for determining whether or not organic compounds are present, both from a scientific interest perspective as well as potentially to understand you have access to minerals that you could use uh, to create things like soils to grow plants. So what is the future for Mars exploration? The most important thing, of course, is having a way to get larger payloads off the surface and to send them to Mars. And the great news is that the commercial space program has taken off. Virgin Galactic had its most recent flight where it's actually you know, having commercial astronauts on sort of like a monthly basis go into space. Um, SpaceX, of course, has the Falcon rockets. SpaceX has the ability to send people to space station eventually in the next year or two. And Blue Origin is also working on launch vehicles and suborbital vehicles and eventually orbital vehicles to take people off world. And the image that you see me standing in front of is the Orion vehicle, which is the vehicle that NASA is working on to send astronauts into basically deep space beyond low Earth orbit to our moon and our own local system to beyond off to Mars. So the launch vehicle technologies and the reentry system technologies are already under development on the government side and on the commercial side to be able to send um, future people, colonies, into deeper into space. 
Another really important one, which I believe has great analogy to the tech sector in general, is artificial intelligence. Anytime you design these systems, you don't want to have people at home doing any kind of control because of the distance between point A and point B doesn't allow for that because of the limitation of the speed of light. So artificial intelligence, using robots to do as many of the menial tasks that you can think of, setting up roads on the surface of Mars, establishing um, habitats. If you can have robots do that and have artificial official intelligence lead what they're doing, you can be more efficient. So all of the technologies that we develop here at home in the AI sector could very easily be used on the space program side. Another really important one, which is probably one of the greatest challenges, is the ability to grow food, right? We can't possibly bring the amount of food with us ahead of time. It just isn't going to work, which means we need to use the resources on the surface of Mars to be able to create soils that we can grow plants in, which we can then eat. And even in this area, we have work that's underway on the International Space Station. We have an experiment called the Veggie Experiment, where we're actually growing plants um, in the space environment. In this case, they're grown in a micro microgravity environment, which is very difficult for plants to grow in. Uh, the good thing is on the surface of Mars, you actually do have gravity, so plants will be able to grow a little bit better. But once again, the technologies are in development in the space program, but this is also a wonderful area for new tech startups to focus on how could I come up with ways to grow plants in the space environment. Which then leads me to the last final concept, which is in situ resource utilization. To be green on the surface of Earth, to be able to feed that forward to how you would run your colonies and your habitats on the surface of Mars, getting power from the sun, being able to get radiation protection from the soil, actually be able to make your own rocket fuel using the CO2 on the surface of Mars to generate meth methane to power yourself back to Earth, and then the ability to grow plants in an extreme environment. And so what this really comes down to is probably not in the next 10 years, but probably in the next 20 to 30 years, we are going to be having people living on the surface of Mars. There was an article that came out just this week about how it's likely that the first person who goes to the surface of Mars will be a female. And so now you can actually think about, or at least for your parents and for your, um, not your parents, but for your children and your grandkids, you can think about how they may one day be able to go to Mars. And the work that we do on the space program is very much funded by governments, and then it feeds forward into the private sector, and it basically trains the next generation of scientists and engineers to be able to facilitate the future of space exploration. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.